Gresham College presents Debussy, Text and Ideas Debussy, The Song Triptych and Finder Siechler, Visual Culture by Dr David Code, Glasgow University <laughs> Thank you all uh, very much for staying almost to the end, we've got one more after me um, you will hopefully find a um, complicated handout with a lot of info in it which uh, is quite important to this paper. Uh, some of the information will prove useful, some of which may not. Um, <clears throat> if you open this handout and read the first little squib I've given you, uh, I sum up a familiar fact. And we'll start from that. From 1891 onwards, Debussy presented the vast majority of his melody in sets of three. But uh, while we have several fine studies of individual songs by now, studies of the whole triptychs have been somewhat rarer. A fresh look has the potential to refine our understanding both of the song cycle as a genre and of Debussy's development across two crucial decades. Today, I simply want to highlight and explore the fact that this turn in Debussy's song elsewhere came exactly at a time in which the painted triptych form was enjoying widespread revival. Consider, for one grand example, the great Sorbonne mural by Puvis de Chavannes, inaugurated in 1889. This great allegory, whose tripartite form is clearer in the preparatory cartoon, received specific mention in the important 1890 essay Définition du néo-traditionnisme by Maurice Denis. Singling out Puvis as the model for a symbolist recovery of the decorative values of the medieval primitives, Denis opens a triptych lineage extending back all the way to the altarpieces of Giotto and Frangelico, who two names he mentions, typically articulated as a central panel flanked by subsidiary ones, which actually were designed to fold over many, in, in many cases. This is only one possible lineage, however, for the very same years also saw the apotheosis of Japonisme, as we were just hearing about. From 1888 to 1891, Siegfried Bing published the journal Le Japon Artistique. In 1890, he curated a, a display of Japanese prints at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. Now, Debussy's Jap Japanisme is uh, well known from the famous Hokusai cover of La Mer that we have just been hearing uh, a rich history uh, about. Um, but I think it's, it's less familiar, the, the less familiar is the fact that the Japanese prints circulating in Paris at the time offered another model for triptych form. So I want to highlight that specific connection today. Literally thousands of three-part prints were produced by Utamaro and later artists, each more inventive in their play with the relation of individual image to unified whole. I don't have time. I can only flash them at you for uh, today. But uh, just, just to note that from Utamaro, you could, you could distribute each one of those as a separate portrait, if you like. Becomes interesting in Hiroshige, you could have a landscape and a, and a domestic scene and an unpopulated domestic scene, uh, but they all fit together nicely. Here, this looks like Kuniyoshi's wonderful. I recommend him to you. Uh, he's reproduced quite a lot, too. Um, it looks like it's completely unified, but look at the care he takes to include one human episode per panel and to alter the scales of the fish in, in particular de decorative ways, panel by panel. Um, I couldn't resist elaborating a little there. Um, the impact of this lineage is clear, for example, in these early works by Pierre Bonnard. Um, and again, I would just say, obviously a unified connect, uh, conception, but a different decorative shorthand, we might say, for the foliage on each, on each panel. Um, compare also uh, another Nabi, Paul Cyrusier, who shows how the brilliant colors and flattened perspective of the Japanese could be synthesized with the primitive altar form, all in order to trace a narrative through the stages of a woman's life. 
Now, I would not nominate any one of these influences as the best, let alone the only, point of reference for Debussy. Their inextricable intermixture emerges clearly from these words of Paul Gauguin, uh, writing from Arles. It's funny, here Vincent sees Daumier type work to do, but I, on the contrary, see another type, colored puvis mixed with Japan. The women here have their elegant coiffure, their Greek beauty, their shawls for forming folds like the primitives are, I find, Greek processions. It's hard to imagine a denser knot of all these different influences. Uh, but still, with a glance to one last example, I'm simply offering these as, a, as I say here, a heuristic to open our thought about the modes and degrees of unity on offer in the song triptychs, a way to open beyond the constraints of conventional musicological understanding. So first, uh, we, we do need a bit of musicological background. Early in her recent survey of the song cycle, Laura Tunbridge notes that the thorny questions of unity raised by this problematic genre lead even Schumann scholars to throw up their hands in exasperation. Ironically, such Germanic foils have held a central place in the understanding of Debussy's song cycles, since Susan Ewens asserted in a 1988 article that, quote, Debussy's cycles are not as musically unified as those of Schubert, Schumann, or Mahler. There are not the tonal, melodic, or rhythmic links of the German leader cycles. There are textual links, even if very general, end quote. As the two exceptions to this very general textual unity, Ewens notes that the Billity songs of 1898 and the second Fet Galant set of 1904, in those two sets, the texts fall into clear narrative successions for all that the local logic, song by song, remains shrouded in suggestion. She does not let this suggestive poetic logic qualify her claim that even a triptych like Fet Galant II is not musically unified. Much recent literature has treated Debussy's songs separately. While Ewens' exceptions have received most attention as triptychs, their unity has largely been framed in textual rather than musical terms. It is in this light that I offer the painterly model as a useful supplement to normative ideas about textual narrative and musical organicism alike. Indeed, approaching these sets with an ear for the broad deployment of hues from an audible palette and the most suggestive interplay of distinct gestures on the sonorous canvas, I offer the Debussy song triptych as exemplary of the basic tension in music and music analysis between diachronic process and synoptic form. A song triptych can distill narrative down to the Aristotelian bedrock of beginning, middle, and end. But like a painted triptych, it may also demand recursive scanning back and forth or out from the center to glean symbolic implications. In the rest of this paper, I will map Debussy's triptychs between these notional extremes. I can only give a quick précy of most, though we will linger on one or two. Ultimately, a glance back over the series can help refine our usual stories about Debussy's place in music history. If you look now to my handout chart and to the screen, uh, we can begin with the Trois Melodies, which, as Ewan's notes, is exceptional for setting nature poetry devoid of human presence. We need to qualify this in view of Verlaine's personified landscapes. La Mère et Pubelle calls the sea a faithful nurse and quotes its words to the poet, you who are without hope, may you die without suffering. In Le Son du Corps, personification shifts to a horn call grieving in the woods. Le Chalonnement finally steps back to an objective view of Colt's gambling on seaside meadows. Apart from a broad affective transition from death-shadowed opening through evening melancholy and out to breezy brightness, there is no clear narrative progression here. A painterly structure is clearer. Two poems that refer to the sea in daylight frame the evening forest setting. Turning to the music, and this is summed up in the last two common uh, keys and musical structure, um, 
we can see how the tempi and expressive characters reinforce that, that painterly reading. Anime l'on assez vif, fast, slow, fast. Um, but in addition, some hints of a unifying thread are accessible to quite traditional organicist analysis. Um, as noted, the first song emphasizes a pair of chromatic motives that are anticipatory of Melisande's theme in Peleas. I say chromatic because the first two instances in blue give us the motive with a, with a semitone uh, at the base of it before a diatonic uh, version uh, emerges at the very end. And it is this diatonic version that is then picked up very uh, directly uh, in the third song. Just to hear that, I'm highlighting this. And then a variant of that, again chromatic, becoming Already, we see some interplay between narrative and painterly types, and some detail that we might catch at to serve uh, deeper formal understanding. Further richness emerges in the Fête Galante one. Oh, there's a, given you a little guideline to my analytical suggestions. Um, Marie Rolf once singled out the 1891 En Sourdine as the song in which Debussy first matched Verlaine's symbolist subtlety. We might now ask whether the whole triptych shows similar sophistication. We begin with an intimate address. The speaker implores his lover, let us melt together our souls, our hearts, and our ecstatic senses. The second song shifts to terse descriptions of commedia dell'arte antics, Scaramouche and Puccinella gesticulate under the moon, the daughter of the Bolognese doctor cavorts with a pirate. Up to here, the only link is a nightingale that appears at the end of Fantoche, as it did in En Sourine. But in the third poem, Claire de Lune, personal address returns, now as vous instead of tu. Now any melting souls are displaced by another reference to the Commedia. Your soul, Votram, is a choice landscape where charming maskers and bergamaskers go about almost sad beneath disguises. The song soon opens out into personified scenery, sad moonlight, dreaming birds, fountains sobbing in ecstasy. Again, painterly outlines are clear. Two songs of address frame one of description. But here, too, it's something more complicated going on. An initial vision of ideal union melting souls, leads to a highly contrasting staging of cliched characters. A final synthesis brings the maskers into the soul of the addressee. Both a narrative reading and a synchronic overview are necessary if the form is to be recognized as a wry reflection on the limits of romantic intimacy. And a musical overview profits from this sense of textual hybridity. If you look in my final columns, you'll see the basic structure of tempi and keys is painterly. Five sharps, no sharps, five sharps, fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow, I'm sorry. Uh, there's also a progression uh, at the level of key from ambiguous B major and G sharp minor through A minor, a kind of in intermediate step, to a more stable G sharp modality. With a closer look, we again find telling musical detail. As Rumpf notes, quote, En Soudine starts with Debussy's most literal statement of the Tristan chord. Here's Wagner again. Um, and that is most literal because it's the exact same space. Wagner was. register just after the bit that you've seen. The E sharp here, which resolves to the F sharp, um, remains a vestige of the voice leading that had made this chord an icon of desire and an apt cipher 
for melting souls. At the end of the triptych, the E-sharp recurs atop the same chord, but now as a pure modal coloration that retains no Wagnerian yearning. So he gives us the E-sharp. archetypically Wagnerian. While any pitch set reduction would recognize the link between the chords, it is only with thought for their different expressive shadings within Debussy's modal chromatic syntax, in particular that E-sharp, that the finest sense of his reading can emerge. Moving on, we, find, we come to the Trois Chansons de Bilitis, selected from a book Pierre Louis published as translations of a fictive ancient Greek poetess. We're now at the bottom of your first page. Um, Debussy's first chosen poem, Pan's Flute, spoken by the young Bilitis, tells of her flute lessons on, in the lap of an unnamed hymn. Their mouths meet on the flute. His, the evening song of frogs breaks their idyll. Next, in La Chevelure, she reports his account of a dream in which they were so entangled in her hair that they became one, and she entered into him like his dream. She responds with a shudder. Finally, she tells of walking in snowy woods and learning from him that the fawns she thinks she's tracking are dead. In the quizzical last image, he holds a shard of ice to the sky and looks through. Everyone notes the basic narrative outline from naive eroticism through excessive intimacy to melancholy aftermath. But other forms are also in view. The first and last songs invoke pastoral landscapes, one in spring, one in winter. The central panel is unspecific in setting. Gibbons aptly terms la chevelure the fulcrum of the form, which fits the stru painterly structure I see as a way of bringing focus to a central question about that extreme, oneric, and sensuous immersion. Musically speaking, indeed, this triptych most richly rewards an analytical approach through my painterly metaphor. And here I've given you the, I'm going to say quite a bit about these pages so you can refer to your text. My shadings don't work very well in photocopy, so I've got a more a technicolor version if you want to, want to look up. In the broadest view, note the studied progression in intervallic hue. The first song begins with 12 bars in which almost every chord is a root position major triad, the most basic consonants. In the second song, almost every beat, not just every bar, but every beat, features a struck major second, a whole tone, whose soft dissonance tinges the whole soundscape. Finally, the third song features a new accented semitone motif, first introduced before your example, it comes to saturate the last page. This partial logic in primary hues is supported in other dimensions. Each song features a linear presentation of a different scale in a similar order of complexity. Song one begins by tracing the seven notes of the antique Lydian mode, which I've circled, as if running the panpipes across the lips. In song two, the modern whole tone scale crosses between voice and piano before we pivot back to the diatonic mode of the previous song for the first climax. Finally, in song three, an inner voice of bar 20 unfurls the starkest octatonic scale in Debussy, stated as eight notes, like the baldly heptatonic mode in song one. You don't have to know the technical definition of the octatonic scale, just that it is the most advanced musical chemistry, to quote, to quote Debussy about in another context. Um, the next two bars follow the precedent in dipping back to recall the whole tone scale of the previous song. Finally, for a deeper sense at the, of the questions at stake here, in my view, consider the harmony. All three songs deploy Debussy's usual third related progressions, but each highlights a distinctive harmonic concept against that syntactical canvas. Only in the first song, and this is your purple shadings and yellow shading, only in the first song, to set the contrast between intimate kiss on flute and distant sound of frogs, do we find an extensive black key, white key polarity, thinking of the piano, uh, akin to the tonalities of darkness and light in Pelias. Only the second song 
makes studied recourse to the tonal circle of fifths, the basic definition of tonal harmony through fully four dominants. Starting from the first climax and ending with the rise to the second, which delivers a fortissimo tristan chord for the line, you entered into me like my dream. Finally, only in the third song do we find a few starkly schematic minor and major third cycles, the last of which you hear again, the most modern way of treating harmony is this schematically symmetrical harmony, uh, the last of which sets up the closing gaze through ice. In sum, the selective interplay of hues, scales, and harmonies across this triptych suggests that Debussy has appropriated these texts for his own particular ends, an interrogation of musical powers, let us say, keyed to a notional three-stage history, past, present, and future, and a question through the voice of Bilitis about what future remains after the death of naive mimesis and affective excess alike. And I think just to attach some sounds to all of these symbols, we might try and hear this. is noodling on the black keys of the piano. Pure white keys now, white keys. And the white stuff is expanded a bit, I've just not. Compare, listening now to that constant presence of the whole tone. Oh, 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 oh,
With this reading of Bilitis, I have effectively extended backwards the allegorical questions about Debussy and history that have previously only been generally been applied to the next triptych. In the second Fête Galante, the first song sets a wry retrospection on youthful flirting, the second a vision of a terracotta fawn cynically regarding present-day lovers, the last a dialogue of a ghostly couple recalling lost passions. Many have read the last chapter of this oblique story as an allegorical farewell to romanticism on the threshold of bleaker modernism. Yet a, a fresh look at the whole offers some slight refinement. For one thing, it is easy to see why Kirchland thought the first two songs had been composed last. Les Ingenues begins on an artificial mode and ends on an F augmented triad. Bizarre ending, non-tonal ending. Um, Le Fon approaches by tonality by featuring that same triad over a G pedal uh, and ends with the augmented fifth F C sharp over the perfect fifth G D. Remarkably crunchy. Colloc sentimental is often applied assigned to A minor, but the early arrivals are on F, and A minor only emerges later. In other words, the set begins by pushing beyond the modern syntax confronted in the last Billity song, and ends with a nostalgic framing of romanticism that gives way to simpler clarity. The possibility that this sequence suggests something other than gloomy concession to modernism becomes clear once we note that Debussy turned, here referring to your chart, at the very same time to the first of his triptychs on older poetry, um, which are the last four listed, um, all of which feature new explorations of antique modality. To conclude, in approaching the forms of these triptychs in this looser painterly way. The progression from Fête Galante I through Bilitis to Fête Galante II can be recognized as a three-stage interrogation of Debussy's own musical languages through the voices of his various vocal personae. But if the Bilitis set emerges as the pivotal framing of the dilemmas of composition after Wagner, to recall Debussy's famous words, I would not want to suggest that the turn to earlier poetry after the last Velen cycle offers a clear answer to the dilemmas so framed. It has proven easy, for example, to label the 1910 Villon triptych as an instance of nationalist reaction as if that context were all we need to place this work in music history. But the composer of this rich antiquarian pastiche was still to find his extreme modernist refinement three years later in the Malachme triptych about which we've heard. Attempting to encompass these contradictory currents in the same oeuvre, I recall the mix of reaction and radicalism in Maurice Denis' art criticism, and wonder whether the whole series of triptychs might facilitate thought about Debussy's place in history in other terms than those of standard modernist historiography. I will give the last word to another symbolist critic who wrote of an exhibition held the year of Debussy's first song triptychs in terms that might aid this search. Quote, in sum, that which stays in the memory after a lengthy visit to the Salon Indépendant is, amidst the recent arrivals and the seekers of surprises, a multivalent curiosity about widely disparate fields of art. There is no longer a school. At most, there are a few groups who are constantly breaking up. All these tendencies make me think of those dynamic and kaleidoscopic geometric designs which mirror themselves at one instant, come apart at another, first conjoin only to separate and fly apart soon after, but nonetheless all keep turning together within the same circle, that of new art. Thanks very much. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.